Thank you for coming. Good evening. Ben Van Burkel recently announced that the exegesis of new architecture might be located in a discourse <laughs> might be located in a discourse on motion. What's architecture in motion? Maybe this. A few years ago, I visited the Lyon Ballet. Up went the curtain. Up went the curtain, and I was astonished to see the troop of dancers artfully wrapped in layers of soft foam, looking like a collection of Michelin men rather than the anticipated dance attire. A tire ad? Humor? Or did we wander into the wrong theater? My immediate supposition was that the Michelin heavyweights had no capacity to move. Weight typically encumbers movement, so the appearance of weight implied an obvious incapacity to move, and by extension, seemed to offer an editorial on the aesthetics of constrained motion. Notwithstanding the audience's apprehensions, the dancers slowly began to dance. Then faster and faster, and surprisingly, the athleticism buried deep beneath the foam inhibited the dancers not at all. What you see is what you get became what you saw but didn't get. Apparently, the appearance of meaning was not the meaning of appearance. The Michelin Ballet was a surprising exhibition of physical prowess and dexterity. Marshmallow dancers to the contrary. The audience was obligated to reject its practice conception of the relationship between visual cause and visual effect. The incapacity prognosis was wrong. The visual postulate and the visual result were instead non sequiturs, almost. Sadly and unnecessarily, at the completion of the performance, the dancers peeled off the foam. Just in case you didn't get it, there was the foam on the floor. So the departing audience, now presumably reassured, were reacquainted, were reacquainted with the traditional dance troupe, sans foam wrapping. Should architecture reveal the secret of wrapped motion? Should architecture unwrap? The Lyon Ballet designers built the incapacity to move, then delivered the incongruous capacity to produce the opposite. Architecture in motion might also conflate appearance and meaning. What we saw and what we thought we knew was what we saw, but not what we knew at all. Is motion subterfuge the architecture discourse Ben Van Burkel is looking for? Please welcome Ben Van Burkel to SIRE. Thanks so much for this um, uh, quite uh, uh, interesting and um, beautiful metaphorical introduction. Um, thanks also for inviting me here. It's, it's quite amazing how many emails uh, I received uh, over the last weeks from uh, so many uh, friends, colleagues, students who uh, are yeah, so overwhelming almost. Uh, it's almost th that I felt that, um, that I lived here for 20 years, uh, but that I didn't. I mean, I, I, maybe it was a long time ago that I was here, but uh, I, I feel really incredible welcomed uh, to, to be here. So um, I, I will my, I give my full heart <laughs> tonight. Um, but I will only talk for an hour, so don't worry. <laughs> you know, architects talk sometimes too long. But, but, but what I'd like to do is to give a bit of a speculative uh, talk, and that is that, uh, that with the title, what is maybe too heavy uh, on the one hand, I'd like also to, to use my time later on, hopefully with some questions, to, to go through some of the 
latest ideas and, 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 and speculations we have been fascinated in. And then I talk about Caroline Boss, myself, and of course the whole team of UN Studio, who, who is constantly uh, interested to, to rethink not only the future of our profession, but also particularly the, the future of the position of the architect. So when we speculate and, and think about the craft, as we like to call it sometimes, uh, we, we like to also think about the themes and the topics and the motives particularly of where we work with. Um, so or, or, or work methodologies or, or strategies around we, the way we work or techniques in the way how we work uh, often have an, um, an influence on the way how, how we uh, develop our work. So UN Studio, as you can see here, uh, is sometimes shifted, mirrored, uh, uh, rethought in the way how we uh, organize ourselves. If you, if you would draw a di diagram, or if you would have seen the diagrams of the organization of UN Studio, they've been changed so over, over, over the last maybe 10 years, maybe in three or four uh, different uh, uh, organizational systems. Like, like lately, uh, what is the... the, the um, the most important uh, development is uh, what we call the knowledge platforms within the organization. And, and what they do is that, that whenever everyone com who comes in the office uh, enters the uh, platform, um, it's not so that you then uh, are operating within the studio as an architect alone. You become a specialist in all either uh, innovative uh, organizational uh, uh, principles or, or uh, you, you might be interested and you, you enter the smart parametric uh, platform or the innovative materials platform but you might move during the years that you are in the studio from platform to platform so that knowledge is exchanged um, and you become an expert in that way you are fascinated in so that doesn't mean that you again uh, are only operating and working as a designer only in the studio, you develop your expertise. So in these knowledge platforms, they've been developed in order to categorize the knowledge, to rethink the knowledge we, we share with each other. Also, to, 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 with this knowledge, to be open towards the outside world. And, and maybe from a uh, collaborative organization and a network, eh, because the United uh, UN Studio stands for United Network, we are, we are lately uh, moving from a network organization to a, uh, towards a more knowledge-based uh, uh, organization. And I will talk about that tonight. I will talk about the way how we group our knowledge and how we regroup our knowledge and rethink the way how we uh, uh, change our observations of, of the work. And with, that, uh, with these changes, uh, give it a new kind of form of direction. So like I said, and sorry for sometimes the primitive diagrams because they're just recently made. Um, but we move from this, as I said, from the cooperative to the collaborative mode to its more co-creative model, whereby from earlier phases, uh, from you know that all, maybe from your studio, that, that we worked with the principle of the diagram, using the diagram not so much as a reductive tool, but as an, a proliferating tool to unfold the possibilities of spatial and infrastructural organizational qualities within the work. And then later on, turn it into an, an, yeah, we call it a thought model or a design model. And the thought model could uh, generate in a particular kind of um, uh, prototype for, for the way how that might move towards the concept of the building. Uh, and the prototypes were then later on, and, and maybe that's also what you know, uh, might turn into a pavilion. So over the last uh, uh, years, and I will show some of them tonight, We've designed maybe more than uh, 12 pavilions over, over, over the time and, and used them as, as reversed engineering towards the way how these pavilions can be um, uh, later on be proliferated into the work itself. But, but in these scales of information and the scales of, of layers of how we inform ourselves and uh, allow uh, consultation and, and, and work with from artists to, to um, people in the movie industry or um, yeah from many disciplines uh, we, we with this involvement we have also been highly interested in how you control this information and for that reason the computational of course we have always promoted the idea of the comp uh, the computational but not simply because 
the computation can generate new, highly fascinating new textures, uh, wonderful forms. But as from the early phase onwards, with the computational, we have learned that it is particularly a fantastic tool to exchange knowledge with, to communicate with, to, to use it as an infrastructure, to apply it to the way how one not only can build, but also can collaborate with, with others as quickly as possible. And we'll talk about it later on as well, that, that today we can often in a 3D model bring in changes in the model up to 500 in a day. And that means that if you're on a building site, that me means that you can update everyone the same day with a 3D model. What is an unbelievable new, I would say, revolutionary way of how we can work with the building industry. I mean, before we could never use these techniques uh, uh, so quick as before. So quickness is a topic we have learned from so much of the last years. But as as we have always argued over the last years, is that the expansion of the profession has been broadened so far uh, and ex expanded so far, uh, not only apart, but maybe we have to put it in a circle whereby the principles of maybe we could say the cultural production of the work and call it the harder side of the work, like the scientific side, had been so fascinating that yeah, and we see that in our own work, I mean, the, the, the more specific we have learned, you can become on the, the harder side of the, of the profession, uh, again, the scientific side of the profession, the more space you have for the quality of the cultural uh, production than, than ever before. So, and that maybe is contradictory, because you, you might say, the better you organize, the better techniques you use, the better you are uh, uh, informed about the, the, the scale of these uh, different levels of uh, exchanging information, that then that will give a particular form of freedom for, for design, let's say, or for the cultural effects of design. It sounds paradoxical, but I will explain it later on. I, I, I maybe in a way, recently, I'd like to go back to, to, to periods where, like for instance, this is the, the Viennese Salon, uh, where um, Freud might sit here together with uh, uh, Klimt and many other scientists and uh, cultural uh, thinkers. And, and of course, the exchange of knowledge, the, the, um, the interdisciplinary quality of all these different of plays between knowledge was here all being shared in one room. And, and the beauty of that time, where everything was so openly uh, uh, in, in the, in the, in the course of, of, of the day, uh, so beautifully uh, um, uh, combined, is where I think today we can think about again, because. With, with these new techniques where I talk about, we can think so holistically again. But it was an unusual aspect of the phase where we're in as architects today. Um, what, I, what I also uh, want to uh, uh, um, emphasize on, for instance, that period in Vienna, uh, where, uh, for instance, uh, like an artist, Klimt, uh, like Klimt or Egon Schiele, they, they were following, for instance, uh, the theories of, of the scientists of, of the day, or, or for instance, Freud. Uh, Freud um, was just coming up with this theory, might have certain ideas where Klimt was not agreeing with, and, and the artists used in that time their paintings as a critique uh, towards uh, this, this call it scientific knowledge of, of the work of Freud. In that sense, I'd like to uh, recognize um, uh, in that sense, I'd like to um, um, advise you to read a book that I just finished. It's a, a, quite a fantastic book by Eric Kandel uh, on, on the age of the insight, who goes back to the history of where scientists and artists were uh, so close and gives, in a way, painting a totally new interpretation of the period uh, than any art his, historic, uh, historian has uh, given it. Uh, but for instance, uh, when, when, when I, with my fascination in art, of course, and, and we have that o had it over the, over the many years for, for, for many reasons, uh, when I look at the work of Schiele and think about the further extension of that work towards the work of Francis Bacon, uh, Francis Bacon, what is so beautiful in the work is that if you look at the hands of Francis this face, that the movements and the gesture of these hands, they say everything about the character and the way how in this large detail of the self-portrait it says so much about the, the, the character. So and I've always thought that, that this principle could 
be used in, in, in architecture, this idea of the larger detail, how the larger detail can say so much more in, as one gesture. Uh, if you guide it well, uh, then let's say it's 20 or 30 ambitions in, in one building. I often think today that it is only with two or three larger details that you can explain the whole concept of the building. This, this ceiling guides you from the entrance towards the first gallery of, of the uh, museum, in this case in Nijmegen, in the, uh, it's called the Falkhof Museum. And, and the movement of the ceiling uh, goes uh, more intense there where you have more daylight, uh, and it goes more quiet uh, where, um, where there is a particular kind of uh, work to be found in the more uh, artificial lit uh, spaces. So, so again, this idea of the larger detail, the larger detail, like for instance maybe the Erasmus Bridge in the city of Rotterdam, um, as, as a an, 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 an gesture what refers back to the history of the industrial city. Uh, this bridge could never be placed in, in a city like, uh, for instance, uh, Den Haag, because Den Haag, as we know, is a more administrative city, or Rotterdam, Rotterdam is, an, as we know, uh, uh, sorry, or uh, Amsterdam, but it's more kind of a historical uh, city. Uh, Rotterdam is having this robust uh, industrial uh, history, especially with, with the bombing after the war, or during the war and after the war, there was so much discussion about uh, how to rebuild the city. This bridge symbolizes that, that, that robustness of, of that history and, and plays more with the, the reference towards the cranes in the harbor than, than anything else. Many uh, uh, different interpretations have been given towards the bridge, but, but it is this particular history what, what, uh, what, what we wanted to uh, uh, bring into the concept of the bridge. Mm. But um, the essence is how this bridge then further expanded towards the new developments and how the city center moved towards the south of Rot Rotterdam with its new developments uh, around it. But this large detail within the city then also can be seen as, as an element uh, whereby uh, with a different light uh, could, could be seen as an element that constantly changes with its uh, condition, its environmental condition. Um, this idea of, of the self-portrait of the location, uh, the way how, like in this house, uh, for instance, uh, you all know this house, it's uh, a house that actually doesn't exist anymore, as we maybe also know, um, but it's going to be rebuilt, luckily enough. Um, a place with a similar uh, idea. Um, the client is Russian, is having a great fascination for uh, gold, uh, what you can see a bit in the facade. Uh, the, 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 but, but in the same time had not a bad taste, but, but liked the idea of that everything would, could reflect back uh, into the house, like the landscape. And this idea of how this reflection of the landscape could not only be used as a reflective self of the person being in the house and having this house, but, but it's also playing with the idea of how the context and the organization of the context might be a, a reflective moment of the, 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 the place where you might uh, hire uh, um, in this, uh, um, in this uh, uh, location. Um, so this, this notion of, of material reflection, spatial reflection, uh, dual, maybe dual materials, as in this uh, project, an earlier project uh, of um, the beginning of the 90s, an electricity station, what we used uh, um, here with this dual uh, approach, um, was used also with, within uh, materials whereby, on the one hand, uh, the basalt lava on the darker side of the building is reflecting um, within this electricity station the idea of frozen, uh, frozen energy, as we, we maybe uh, uh, referred to in that time, and, and, uh, and the aluminium on the other side has produced by a lot of energy. So this polarization between these two materials were, were, were uh, um, polari yeah, heavily polarized towards each other. But for instance, in the Möbius house, an opposite effect was uh, used not on the outside alone, but also where the two materials, the glass and the concrete, like in the Möbius, where you have two surfaces, who move from the outside slowly towards the inside of the belt, 
we used also within this house. So the glass slowly moves sometimes from an outside <coughs> facade towards an inside facade. Whereby it is not always so easily possible to know where the inside and the outside of the house is to be found. So as you notice, I'm, I'm not going to go through each project in detail, but I try to make the links and the, and the relationships and, and want to try also to recap some of the motives of the way how the work comes together. Like this material duality where I talked about, or the double reading, the dual, dual reading of the materials, the way how they can be further expanded in, the, in, the, in a kind of moving concept, a concept that constantly can be changing as maybe was explained in the introduction, is uh, what, what has always uh, been the interest. So, so we've also argued for geometrical changes where, where, where it doesn't matter to us anymore. Who cares, we said, who cares about the box? Who cares about the blob? Uh, let's, let's transform geometries. Let's see how we can transform geometries. Um, it's far more important today, with especially the techniques we have, that we can liberate any kind of geometrical, uh, stylistic uh, reference where we always so categorize the architecture with. We, we don't have to categorize, luckily enough, anymore. We can categorize uh, and, 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 and liberate uh, categorization through the transformative aspects of uh, architecture. Like in this uh, uh, laboratorium space, the facades opens up. They're together maybe with, with, with uh, the, the, the moment where the tree uh, uh, awaits to become green uh, during the summer. And another part of the building uh, towards the corner opens itself up as well towards the greener side of the building. And this duality is also used in the two materials of the way how uh, that is used in the inside of the building. But, but in another latest project, this is in a villa we are working on right now, uh, I always like to refer here to the hands of the, the painting of uh, Chile, where, where almost like the, the intertwined quality of the wooden sticks uh, across each other and, and make with the moving in and out a an, an light moment to be captured uh, for the inside of the house. So du duality and the play of uh, compactness in duality uh, where, where the light is filtered, uh, like in this museum for, for uh, 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 art, modern art in uh, Beijing, what, uh, what actually was only a competition, so, so luckily enough uh, didn't win. Uh, sometimes I'd like to not win because then I can expand these ideas uh, much more better towards other ideas. But, 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 but the, 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 the quality of this play with light and reflective light and, and again the two volumes constantly change while you move around the uh, building. But talking about these larger details within the projects, like for instance the voids we often uh, use as, as, as elements to play with, to create a kind of form of absence, uh, an absence of, of, a, of an imagination. When you're standing in the void and often one, one doesn't know where the physical aspect of the architecture is to be found or where the spatial architecture is giving you the opportunity to, to, to imagine uh, 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 more than that what is really happening within the architecture itself. So a void often attracts many, uh, as we often say, uh, looking up effects. And, and we know in architecture there are a lot of uh, beautiful looking up effects to be found from the Hagia Sophia towards the, um, well, many buildings we know. Um, but this is a particular kind of uh, kaleidoscopic moment in the Mercedes-Benz Museum uh, where where the car and the spatial effect around the car is, is to be seen in such a way that, that maybe as almost Rosaline Kraus would describe it, whereby each sculptural effect of the car could be seen in many different uh, angles. So almost as if you leave a dream or enter a dream when you are in this part uh, of the building. Um, yeah, and it was actually so that, that, that when we uh, designed this building, the client was not so often thinking about uh, 
designing a museum, uh, they were thinking more about a uh, yeah, kind of showroom. Uh, but with, with uh, several visits to its museums, and particularly the modern Museum of Modern Art, uh, where we know that there is this fantastic green helicopter hanging in the uh, uh, foyer, in the lobby, we argued that, that well, if that is possible, if an industrial product can hang in the Museum of Modern Art, why could not the car be an, an, an cultural product? So why could the car not be, not be seen as a sculptural element uh, in, 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 an, in, an, in a way whereby we make a public construct for this museum apart for the brand alone? So, so but whenever you, you leave or enter this space, it's highly kaleidoscopic and it plays with time. And the time, in maybe also in a kaleidoscopic manner, so maybe you might be in different times at the same time. And I will talk about it later as well. We, um, and as we know, we, we don't design any more spaces in a, in, a, in a classical camera way, but by the 2.5D effect, in the way how we move around the building is only experienced by, by, by the camera alone, as we uh, maybe uh, believed in, uh, in, in, let's say, in the last uh, century, where through a kind of Gideon uh, approach, um, uh, we, we thought of the time-space condition, but it was very linear. Here I'm talking much more kind of richer uh, spatial experience. But the texture of this void and the articulation of the void uh, it is here extremely important. So, so when you are in the void you, and you, you look up, you can almost not see where you are in the building or you can see what the building is all about. But when you look down, then, then, then suddenly the building is revealed to you. And uh, one might think that it's also almost a Freudian reference, but I don't know if that was uh, in, the, in the unconscious of our mind <laughs> when we designed this void, but the whole idea of that, that the construction uh, the visual uh, con uh, complexity of the two double helix elements within the routing of the building becomes here clear as a time machine is, is maybe the essence of what you discover when you're slowly moving down in the building because you are, you are going first to the top layer and then slowly move down into, into these two parts of the exhibition spaces. But as I said, the texture of this uh, 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 void space is so diverse and complex that if you take one part from the highest level, then you can always move back to the second part. So there is, this is the second routing. And you have to understand this is kind of unfolded section. So this is CC. So you see here the, the, the full section of the building. But, but what is interesting is that this routing is much more used than this route. Although nobody is not going to this space, because simply when you are in this route or on this route, then you can see always, because of the daylight, you can see that this, this uh, exhibition space is there. So you can uh, understand that there are these kind of uh, pocket spaces hanging onto this route. And of course, you can take this route, but, but when you discover it, then you can take it. But this is more the main route. And maybe I show you that here in this effect. So you can see that the, 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 the historical line of the exhibition space is more in a kind of day lit, sorry, in the artificial lit spaces. And the other, uh, 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 the collection spaces are uh, uh, more articulated through daylight space. And you, you just follow through the twist, uh, a quite an important constructural twist. You, you just follow the daylight to go to these, uh, um, um, uh, collective spaces in order to discover them. So you, you just uh, walk towards the light. So the whole idea of the vertical void is not here only there. I mean, there are the, these diagonal effects and, and one can say the horizontal voids are to be followed out of the, the vertical void. But this texture, this inner texture of the, of the void is then turned also to the whole articulation of the facade. So the, the, so it's not a classical relationship between the organization of the building towards the way how the facade is articulated, no, it's the texture of the void space, what is articulated in a zigzag movement towards the way how, uh, when you're moving from a higher level to a lower level in, in the building, can almost look 
look through the floor almost towards the highway, what is around the building. So the, the car is also to be found around the building as if the car drives into the building. And, and so many other aspects around maybe this notion of the void and the diagonal effects of the void have been capturing here uh, the organization like, like and that was uh, maybe a discussion, we, um, sorry, a discussion we all knew uh, in the uh, mid-90s, uh, the play of the way how the single surface could frame in one gesture uh, a constructive articulated uh, uh, movement of the space. Um, but here, it's not a single surface in, in, in the, let's say, in the classical understanding of the single surface. It's, it's a, a full complex three-dimensional system whereby the single surface is taking up these two routing spaces uh, within the organization of the building. And you can see that here. So this floor is not on the same height as that floor. Also, the, 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 the complex reading of the external effect of the building is, is quite diverse, because you, when you enter the building, you think that the building is only three stories or four stories high. But if you are in the building, then there are more than, than nine plateaus where you're connected to. And, and you can Im imagine how nice it was to stand in the void when, you, when we were working on it. Also, it was a very funny moment, actually, when we, the client asked us to do a 1 to 13 scale model. We didn't understand why, why he wanted to have a 1 to 13 scale model, but we thought, I mean, he pays for it. I mean, there are many models made during the, the building process, but then later on, when, when, when they came with a little car, and I place it into the model, 1 to 13, of course, then we understood why. <laughs> but this capacity of endlessness, and, and, and we know the notion of endlessness in architecture, uh, uh, and, and of course uh, that, that was Kiesler, but this idea of this, I, this, this, this will to, to, to play with the idea that there is no end to be found in the building, uh, and that was also instrumentalized first in the in the Möbius house and then later on in this in this articulation of the uh, Mercedes-Benz Museum played with this idea of duration. So how could we move around and experience a, a more complex space-time condition than, than, than we had experimented before within architecture. So, so there's a whole idea of the, the notion of duration. Uh, duration played a very important role in that. Also, maybe the, the key is there, of course, that, that one then also brings in a public construct. And maybe that's the key of architecture, that we bring people together and that they, that they are constructed in a, in a manner through the organization uh, in such a way that you experience architecture uh, on such a level whereby maybe uh, with that you create a kind of form of so, uh, moments of social proving, I'd like to argue. It's like with, with in a museum that you see two or three people standing at a painting, and you think all the time, why, why the hell are they so so long they're standing at a painting? And then you want to also go there, and then you know the more, the longer these people stay, the long, the more people come to that place, and that's what we have often noticed around the edge of the void, for instance, of the Mercedes-Benz Museum. People hang around the, the the balconies of the the void in order to look down, in order to create this kind of uh, uh, interaction of this public construct we created within the space. Um, so as, as I said, um, um, the Möbius House was the first uh, experiment playing with this idea of the, 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 the Möbius uh, gesture and, and, and where, whereby living, working and sleeping was all to be introduced in one kind of concrete uh, uh, structure. Uh, but it was particularly also related to the four quadrants of the landscape. So each part of the house, for instance, he in the house wanted to work in this part of the landscape, and she of the house wanted to work in this part of the landscape. And, and this idea of pro the programmatic uh, to its time, uh, contextual ideas was brought into one gesture. So the diagram of the Möbius didn't come in as a kind of diagram we built. But, but we instrumentalized it towards the, 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 uh, the conditions of the, the many complex layers within the way how we use all these ingredients to be brought into this one gesture. Um, oh. That's uh, that slide, oh. So, so, but similarly, like in the Mercedes, 
uh, Benz Museum, you, you understand that it is a continuous line. It's a trifold organization. If you put your pen on this line, you cannot take it off anymore. So, 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 so that's how the structure came together. And sometimes, even lately, uh, with, with this notion and display of the line, we knot these spaces and become far more three-dimensional than, than ever before. But also, in, again, going back to ma dual material effects and material effects, we, we use these ideas of duration and time also uh, um, in, for instance, a project like this. Um, it's a um, it's, uh, it's uh, workspace in uh, Almere, in uh, Holland, whereby the colored facade um, uh, with uh, different angles of light coming towards the building, and you stand in different uh, uh, positions of the building, <coughs> changes almost in nine different colors, um, and creates quite unbelievable, uh, uh, unusual, sorry I have to say, not unbelievable, unusual, for, for us also surprising uh, shadows. Uh, it creates sometimes yellow, yellow shadows or blue shadows, and, and it's often um, uh, so that, uh, and it was a, a bit also uh, after we had seen it in the first uh, mock-ups of the, of the design, used in the, in the way how we organized the, later on the garden of the, of, the, of the inner court of this office, uh, whereby people can follow the shadows, uh, particularly there where there is a lot of uh, uh, light coming into the shadows, then, then, then um, some of the people working in the spaces there might say, hey, it's yellow time, let's go for lunch. Or, or in the loft, uh, for, had a design we did for an art collector in uh, New York. We created this kind of dynamic uh, moment within, yeah, maybe his, maybe one of his most dynamic paintings, of of the view uh, looking over Manhattan uh, from this uh, uh, window. Uh, we were also responsible for the the back of this dog, actually. Also. <laughs> So, so, so moving from the geometrical towards the mathematical and, and f back and forwards, uh, playing with all these uh, experiments of geometry and, and mathematics, we have been, uh, of course, uh, uh, like in the Mercedes, uh, interested in these minimal services. So if I talk about the trifold organization and the endless effect of the trifold organization, uh, we, we try to make it three-dimensional so, so that it would absorb a lot of aspects around construction, uh, infrastructure, the distribution of program, and as I mentioned, time. So, so what we discovered, that, that what we always believed in modernist architecture, that, that the grid absorbs the most ingredients in architecture, I discovered that that was not anymore true, that, that maybe even more, uh, the mathematical could absorb much more uh, ingredients than ever we used the uh, uh, geometrical effects in architecture. So, but it all started with 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 with, with earlier projects like I'm talking now about. You can see, it, and this is still my own uh, hand uh, drawing uh, from uh, the early '80s, uh, where in this idea of the void and the texture of the void, and the play, the first test of a mathematical uh, 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 three-dimensional void space uh, was here tested in the uh, uh, dream house, but it was never built. And and. In the latest work, you can see that here we played with the idea of how a void space can be so fascinating in its texture while looking, looking up. And while you come up into the elevator, you might see so many different layers of the infrastructure and its surroundings uh, in the same time that uh, you would uh, constantly have a dialogue with a closed, uh, monolithic almost a void space uh, towards a much more open uh, void space towards the, the context of this uh, um, uh, building. It's almost like, like what I mentioned before, uh, that that the whole idea of the black holes of the face are twisted. The black holes and the white wall. Maybe I'm referring here to the fish. The the maybe you know this wonderful text of uh, uh, Deleuze when he de uh, describes faciality so beautifully, and describes the whole history of faces. Um, but, but this notion of that the face can be twisted and turned and be pulled in so many different angles, whereby the black hole is not anymore seen as a kind of traditional facade mask element, has been, of course, uh, been in play here. And also, 
when you look, for instance, in this void down, then suddenly you discover what, what this building is all about. It's just a shift of infrastructural elements who are, are placed in a different uh, uh, movement around the core of this building. Maybe that brought us also to the idea of, of the texture of the facade, whereby two graphical effects create a kind of more reading of the building. Like, so for instance, if you are moving around the core of the building and you look out, we tested how this movement of these secondary class elements could filter the light and, and um, stop the light in a way uh, to, to enter uh, 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 the building um, uh, uh, there where necessary. And see how that works here. So there is an, an, well, there's one class structure and a secondary structure in order to filter the light down into the building. So to make the building also, strange enough, quite thin in the night, and, and that's quite interesting with, with media effects, uh, is that, that the building suddenly can turn into a, a kind of surface, and a surface you can maybe not fully understand always, because, um, because it becomes so thin. It's almost like, like in the way how Warhol would talk about, about his paintings, you know, there is nothing to be found behind the surface. Look at me, I'm only surface. <laughs> so, but, but uh, here's maybe the one, one of the most complex uh, void spaces we did uh, in a uh, latest project in Korea, whereby it's almost impossible to, to understand the amount of layers and floors to be, uh, to be found in the building. So the, the, um, it's, it's like, uh, it's, a, it's a shopping place, but, but strange enough um, with, with the whole idea of uh, referring back to uh, shopping uh, and this fascination uh, um, of shopping in the work of uh, Warhol, um, who loved shopping actually. He, he, Warhol believed that, um, that when we would die, we would all end up in Bloomingdale's. So, so, so we should actually celebrate that idea of uh, 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 make, making a shopping more as a cultural center. <laughs> and that's what, what this building is all about. The, the, the products within this building are all to be exposed, are so exposed that they look l more like art pieces. Um, um, but as I said, it is a highly complex space with all the di different balconies and the activities around the balconies are all public. Also, we were able uh, with this client to introduce far more different programs within the project than, uh, than only uh, shopping alone. Like there is a uh, cultural center, there are exhibitions there, there is a cinema, um, a, a place for kids. And again, when you look down and suddenly you understand the project. And the articulation on the outside is uh, similarly playing with this idea of, the, may, maybe as a test to further extend that idea of the moray. In, in such a fact that if you walk along the building, you think constantly that there is a an, an, an deep texture happening within the building, so that it's double curved and highly diverse, but, but it's only two layers of uh, facade elements who do this effect. In a music theater in Graz, similarly, uh, during the day, uh, the building looks very close, but it, during the night, it's opening itself up to, um, towards its uh, a f a more uh, less uh, vertical void space, more a diagonal void space. Whereas almost, if you would enter the music theater, you could look at music. And, and the articulation of the spaces are so made that, that uh, although this is a place for students, uh, the public can come also in the building and, um, and can enjoy that uh, void space for, for, for many different events to be happening within this project. So the articulation of elements, like maybe also in the acoustic wall, walls of the, oh sorry, I'm going too far. Sorry. Like in the acoustic walls here of the uh, music theater, it's a, a simple black box where, where all types of music could be played. So, so from uh, classical music to electronic music, jazz. And for that reason, we had to do this highly complex uh, acoustic wall. The articulation of this wall uh, maybe p almost uh, motivates or, or stimulates uh, the idea of imagining that they're all notes coming out of the, the, the music instruments. Uh, at least this is what, uh, what uh, the professor often believes when he's dreaming away. In this. 
but, but these articulations of these textures are not seen as decorative uh, articulations. They're seen as spatial, as you can particularly see here. They're seen more as spatial, time-based uh, organizational qualities. And here maybe the, the notion of the black hole or the blue hole uh, to which the white wall is, is so diverse and complex that we had not, we could not actually construct, and then I'm talking here about the, the, maybe the harder side of uh, uh, the, 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 the development of the work and, and the maybe almost, I would like the scientific experiments we do within the work is that here the concrete could not be pulled down, uh, top down. We had to press it up in order to uh, make uh, the concrete as smooth as possible on the underneath sides of the, of, the, of the double curves to be found in this uh, quite uh, complex uh, surface area. So I, I, can Im I can tell you that was quite an uh, amazing event to press up all this concrete. So this whole twist, the central twist, carries almost a, a cantilever of uh, close to uh, 20 meters. So, so f from this notion of the twist and, and the movement of this twist, everything is guided around it. So the infrastructure, the views, the way how you walk in the building, the wayfinding. Uh, so, so again, here, construction, the construction of this minimal surface is not only there to be found only for the construction alone, but it guides and distributes many architectural ingredients. And as I mentioned in the beginning, that's why for that reason we use all these pavilions. <coughs> and these pavilions are test grounds, prototypes for the way how we can, what we call reverse engineer back the design. So here we learn from how we could do some of these uh, double curved surfaces in a way whereby um, from a com uh, complex uh, public construct, at the end of the pavilion, we can reverse back the engineering of the way how we made this uh, project in, in, in a quite complex manner between steel and, and wood, and have finished uh, in, in a quite maybe simple way, um, so that we uh, could uh, follow the development of the craft, so how, uh, how we could use this technique also for casting techniques for concrete. So we, we further expand these ideas then in this latest project uh, of, an, uh, of an house in, in, in Stuttgart, I'm playing with uh, the parallax view, the double experience of the landscape and the, and the owners of the house. And it's almost like if the, the landscape is echoed back into the house and the other way around. So this parallax experience, I would like to almost call it, is what, uh, what, what you can uh, see and, and, and uh, uh, what you can discover within the house. So when you enter the house, I didn't explain it, and you come into the living room, then you look up um, towards the higher part of the hill um, in this house, and, and that's what you see here. This part of the house lifted up towards the way how you then, from the staircase, the central part of the house can view up the hill of this uh, uh, wine area around the house. But we even use these ideas for the furniture we design. Like this is called a sit table. You can sit in this table. It's quite an unbelievable uh, success right now. I, I, it was in the beginning quite difficult uh, with the prototype we designed, but now it's running, especially in England, because young startup companies they love to have only one furniture. Uh, when when they move from uh, from one uh, office space to the next, they can take the furniture instead of 20 other furniture, because they all sit around the table, they sit in the table, they can have the clients there, they can work on the table. So it's a kind of it's interesting how almost a table can become a space but you can move around. So as I talked about this idea of collaboration and, and the principles of how we m move slowly on with, with our knowledge in the work and categorize it and 
discipline it and, and, and move with the concepts and turn the concepts. We, we are lately so fascinated also in, in the invisible side and the engineering side of architecture. Like this, this smoke uh, detector, the smoke tornado is introduced in the Mercedes-Benz building so that, um, that when there is a fire, in five minutes all the smoke will be sucked out of the building. And, and I mean in Germany, I don't know if uh, there are some German people here today, but it's quite amazingly difficult to get uh, some, like the Mercedes-Benz building, as complex uh, through the regulations. But we, after a while, uh, testing this one-to-one -one with all the people from Stuttgart standing here, uh, videoing it, it was allowed, and, and uh, through its test, to, uh, to be part of the, the design of the building. But the reason was simply because we could reduce, with this smoke detector system, almost 15% of the, not only the cost of the building, but also 20% of the materials in the building. So we didn't have to compartmentalize the whole building. What is now everywhere, of course, a question. So how to compartmentalize? But this invention was not my invention, I'd like to argue uh, with you, because it, it was a collaborative and co-creative, uh, innovative idea of many people coming together and inventing this. And of course, that made it the building as it is, with its void space where I talk about but most of the time I don't talk about these things, or I don't talk about the concrete core activation. But we now use almost in all our buildings, whereby the building in its concrete can be heated up for three hours and then uh, could stay warm or cold for the rest of the day. So that reduces down an enormous amount of uh, energy cost. Um, and this maybe shows also a little bit more the harder side of the profession in the sense of the complexity of it. We, we had only one and a half year to, to build this project. Uh, and, and in that time, when we were working, and I'm talking really about 2005, <coughs> four, five, we didn't have grasshopper. We, didn't, we couldn't really work yet with programming um, yet. So, so we had developed our own program with a team of almost six people within the office. And as I said, today we can allow 500 changes in a 3D model in a day. In that time, we could do 200 changes in, in, in the 3D model of uh, the change of this uh, 3D model. And that meant that we were very fast. But it meant also that we were taking away an incredible amount of management work from the managers. We, the client discovered that we were faster than the managers than on the side. So, so in that sense, a new concept of control is introduced for the architect, but is a total new uh, uh, liberation for the position of the architect. Before, we were asked as architects only to design a facade because the organization of the building, of an office building, was already clear for many clients. But of course, you have to discipline it. You have to, like the twist is repeating over four or five layers, four layers. Uh, and also, through the manufacturing, we introduced the glass technique of cutting the glass so that we could produce 700 different types of glass within the building, but without, uh, let's say, complex uh, amount of uh, extra cost, because it is cut it so that where two or three, yeah, two angles are the same, and the third one is always changing. So this kind of form of, what we call a kind of form of me mechanical objectivity, whereby um, through, let's say, new techniques, uh, we, we not only use the computational, of course, but we like to understand the, 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 the way of how through the subjective play with that what we do with the, the maybe the classical idea of the mind hand eye effect of how through the computational then the two can have a dialogue with each other. So, so the scientific maybe like in this drawing is not only to be found in the way how we work with the computer today. Scientists in the earlier phase uh, they drew nature. They didn't photograph it, or they didn't use the telescope alone. Of course, in the earlier phase, one was drawing them, but actually, in that time, we were far more holistic often to, re, um, to copy nature. Um, because, I mean, in, in this way, as we draw it here, you could not photograph it so easily. So the full aspect of nature was, was drawn. And this is what we believe, too, that, that, that maybe the history of the computational has been so hermetically 
uh, uh, placed in, especially in architecture, as uh, computer science. Architecture in its computer development uh, within computer science, so as a close hermetic system. But maybe we should see it in the history of the perspective and the development of the telescope and the camera, the photo camera, and the way how we drew realities before. But I'd like to uh, end with, with uh, one uh, last project, and I'll do that very quickly. And, and maybe the last thing I would like to say about close innovation and open innovation is that, that open innovation is uh, much more linked towards uh, the expertise and the way how we could further hybrid uh, the combination of co uh, collaboration. And of course, for that reason, the, the, the network uh, model of the uh, the knowledge uh, 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 platforms within the office, not for the way how we work alone, but particularly also for the way how we uh, make our buildings. So the latest is the, that we believe that, that it is the attainable where we need to stand for. If there is a future for architecture, it is the attainable, whereby architecture takes on a kind of different responsibility, not to its flexibility or the so uh, social sustainable alone, but also in, in the way how we make or buildings far more uh, intelligent, um, with not only the architect there standing and saying, I'm standing in front of the orchestra, and you have to do, do all the design. We, we believe far more in a John Cage-like approach where you walk through the orchestra and that all the specialists playing with you the, 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 the music. So in this building, um, uh, it's a, it's a uh, project in uh, Stuttgart, it's a an, an science center uh, for virtual engineering. It's an office building, but, but the client uh, was so quite amazingly contemporary, they didn't want to have an office building. They believed that it should be a building all about that what I explained tonight a place for experiment, a place for new forms of co collaboration where there will be laboratorium spaces connected to a central space where everyone would meet. So they wanted me to hide all the elevators in the building. No elevator in the building. Well, elevators there because there are regulations, but nobody could see the elevators. So everyone would move the void space to collaborate, to meet, and to exchange knowledge within this, within this experimental building. So and that's what we did. Um, we tried to introduce a kind of new form of flexibility by reducing the weight and creating large pens so that we, over the time, could always change the flexible aspects of the program. Um, and this is what we do with lo uh, lately a lot of buildings, is that, that some of our other buildings can be all turned into housing. Um, but as I said, the void space is so designed that you can always meet each other, see each other, and, and, and have your dialogue whenever you would like when you walk around the staircase. Colors give, give the wayfinding so that they are friendly towards the way how you know where you are in the building, if it is a blue staircase, green or yellow. The active uh, notions of sustainability, mass, material, and efficiency are all combined so that constantly when we moved around with with the 3D modeling technique and shifting of the shafts, we try to make the, the building as compact as possible. And we know that all the more compact, the more sustainable the, the building can be. And of course, uh, moving around the windows so that they would not catch so much light uh, and heat, uh, but would move away from the south. But as in this exhibition we had in, uh, in Harvard, uh, uh, where, I've, where I'm teaching at the moment, the pavilions and the experiments we do are, if you move around this exhibition space, you, you can see that you step into the pavilion, you step out of it. It's almost like a parallax experience where I talked about. And it's almost like what was described in the introduction. It's, it's so that, that Within the conceptual motion of the change of the architecture, and maybe the future of the role of the architecture, where architecture can lead to, it's maybe interesting how motion matters, how, how motion can turn into conceptual motion and change. So architects have always been structural objectivists, you could say. They've been always playing with objectivity uh, there where it is, of course, uh, 
possible to be objective. Uh, there was a beautiful interpretation of objectivity given by an artist once called Michelangelo, not Michelangelo from the 16th, 17th, uh, 16th century, but an, a contemporary artist who uh, argued that, that through the smashing of his mirrors, he could create million uh, readings of reality. And that's often the most important, to bring all these highly complex different forms of realities together into one, one uh, gesture, as, as the way how architects always did. So I'd like to end here. Thank you very much. But I, I was asked uh, um, to ask you questions. And, and I really want you to ask me questions because I, I need reflection on uh, this uh, talk. <laughs> and if you have no question, that's what Jeff Kipnis always does. He, but what he does, he's, he just points at someone. Neil, you're going to be the first one. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, I, I was left thinking with, with, with two thoughts, actually. Um, one that, I mean, you refer to um, a lot of artists. And in fact, it's the, the Dutch artists, I always thought, who, who, who mixed up their own paint and who had to understand the material properties of the paint. Um, that, that were really the most convincing. And I think that's the way I see your work, is understanding material properties in order to get beyond the simple fetishization of material towards some other overall effect. That was one thought I had. The second thought I had was that often with architects you find... Um, I mean, Bernard Schumi came out as a, as a very theoretical... started off as a very theoretical architect. And then after a while, all that sort of um, outrageous theorization kind of dried up a bit. And uh, he once explained to me that he couldn't write anymore because he had to write all these kind of very objective kind of construction um, documents. And, and it, it lost that kind of poetic thing. But strangely, you've almost gone the other way. I mean, it's become more and more kind of theoretical and reflexive and, and so on, which I think is, is commendable. And I, I, I guess that beneath all that, there are all these other sort of, you know, hassles of getting the building built and, 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 and economic and other things, but you managed to sort of float above that in a very refreshing way. So um, I enjoyed the talk. And I, I feel like there's a, there's a book coming out, a kind of theory yes. of all this that's kind of uh, knitting together Freud and something else and some art history and so on. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, you didn't get it from me. But. Yeah, what can I say? It's a, you only have a comment, but, but it is true that um, that I use phases of, of reflection. It's not always so that I do that for, for every day. Like you cannot think about culture every day. You have to produce. And, and I believe that if there is an oceanic feeling where Freud talked about, about but when you produce, you know that, when you produce, when you write or when you produce your stuff, then you get into so good, such a good flow. And that's where I believe in. You need to get into the flow of the production as well. So then sometimes I have years that I don't really teach or write, but just do the work. But, but, but maybe the, 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 the fantastic uh, uh, play we have right now in the office between the different partners coming in and Caroline being there, you know, that we've, we've always been able to, to, to have the opportunity to write together. Um, and there are even now more people involved in the writing um, and doing the research. And, and, and now I'm teaching at two places where <laughs> I didn't teach for a long time. So it's true. And what you said about the Dutch painters is also true. Um, but I've always been, for that reason, fascinated in, in techniques. You know, it's not so often that, you know, as an artist or an architect, it's sometimes a bit funny to talk about where do you work with them why you use particular techniques and why, what is the advantage of it. 
but I think it's so important. Frank. So there's a sense of procession and then enlightenment. Can you talk a little bit about that? Procession and? Procession and enlightenment as you move through the building. Yeah, I... How do you think about it? That's, uh, that's an, maybe that's going, yeah, that's related to maybe Dutch painting. <laughs> that's maybe related to Dutch painting because, to because, Duchamp. Huh? or Duchamp. Yeah, yeah, but, well, of course, I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, I mentioned Kiesler as a, as a fantastic uh, architect, artist, who, who I studied so intensely. Um, of course, I mean, it is to be found in the work of the Venice painters, for instance. Eh? The Venice painters didn't set up first the geometry when they said, like, Tintoretto didn't use uh, geometrical uh, 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 principles f before he started to work on his paintings. He, he let the geometry grow coming out of the painting. Uh, so he was actually, uh, with a lot of uh, other uh, Venice uh, painters, uh, having an opposite uh, belief in, in how the Florentine painters uh, worked. So I, 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 for that reason, I like to, uh, what, uh, what Eric also said in the beginning, I like to work with that idea of motion and, and perception. And, and not only particularly that you work to uh, move towards the light alone, but that you are that you're guided by curved walls, for instance, and, and the articulation of a, of a wall what gives you direction. I, I often like to see where you come from. <laughs> and that's often in a linear space, not always the case. But the curves orchestrate the procession, and then you arrive at a, at a room, which is kind of an enlightenment. That's how I see it. Yeah, but, is that but, right? yeah, but I mean, and the idea of procession and enlightenment would mean almost a religious approach. Yeah, but I, I would actually be careful. <laughs> we need a new pope. <laughs> yeah, there is hope. Yeah, for sure. Keep hope alive. Yeah, I wanted to thank you, actually. I think it's, it's a very unusual presentation. And I think when, when the topic, the computational topic comes up, it always seems to be sequestered in a particular time, with particular data, with particular strategies. Nobody talks about Warhol and Tintoretto. Never, ever, until. So I think, I think that in a, to put a contemporary discussion in a frame of reference, in your terms, endlessness, meaning you're adding to it, but it belongs both to something that's coming and something that's behind us. So you understand now a computational discussion in, in, a, in a fascinating way. But I have to say, one, and, and when, when Frank just was, was mentioning the, the movement as if you move through to a particular destination, but on the other hand, this is not endlessness. This is the, a different idea, which is an end. And your arguments seem to be a kind of infinite argument mixed with an argument which has something to do with objectivity, knowledge, science, learning. And the, in a way, they're illegible. You could, you could argue that the result in many cases is the opposite of the argument. Because depending on how you show it, and a lot of the way you show it is a function of the photographs you take, it's, it's if not illegible, it's enigmatic. And the intention is to obfuscate the conceptual intentions in terms of information which produces a whole series of conclusions which you can't read, depending on where you are. So, in a sense, you're arguing experientially in a direction which seems to be contradictory to the, to the hypothesis about the, the collection of information which leads to a certain conclusion, which you don't get. No, you don't get it tonight. But, but you... <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 uh, 
but I simply mean by that you will get it when you are in the buildings. You're right. Yeah, you, you can. Yeah, no, no, but I mean, you, but but it is true that where I talk about is contradictory. What I said. I mean, if I talk about the expansion of the profession, and I really am very serious about it, that that it is unbelievable right now when I sit with a client together, that he's not coming anymore there alone. You know, I used to have clients like 15 years ago who would come alone and say, Ben, can you for 10 million, you know, three weeks. Yeah, hello, I mean, but then, you know, I could make a deal there because I was there alone too. But now there are lawyers, there are all these advisors around, 20, 30 advisors around a client for a project that is even 6 million. So, so that means that the whole expansion of the profession is, is mm -hmm. also with its knowledge and, and its techniques has been so expanded on the side of where, where you could say uh, everything is dealing with a new form of controllability, <coughs> or new concepts of control, uh, that that is, that is far more different than let's say 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And on the other hand, we can expand in enormously on the level of uh, the cultural effects, like, like, you know, we can refer to, to movies, film, uh, art, as much as, much as we uh, uh, know. So, so this contradictory effect of working on the both sides of the profession, that is actually also where I'm talking about. So on the one hand, I'd like to talk about um, the way how we learn through the most uh, advanced uh, techniques we can work with, on the other hand, to create with that a new form of freedom for the architects. And, and maybe the complexity of the spaces, like where you talk about that, that spaces are not only in front of you, but they, they follow you in a way also, that, that experience you cannot get tonight. You will not get it tonight. Uh, but you have to, for that reason, to be in the building. And I, I, but I try to describe it. I try to describe to be in a time, in a space-time condition of a building where you are in many times in the same time. And that's what, what, what I, I, I hope you will, will experience when you are in these buildings. Spaces are highly kaleidoscopic. Well, of course, I mean, do you, uh, should I repeat that? Um, so Frank is asking, are your spaces endless and never stop? But, but honestly, there is an entrance, of course, <laughs> and an exit. Yeah, you can step out. <laughs> Yeah, but don't you, I mean, don't you find it interesting? I mean, it was, of course, uh, it was Kiesler who played with that idea first, this idea of endlessness. Um, but it is such a surreal, interesting idea. I, li I like also the idea of, to think of that you can sometimes, uh, instead of looking from the unconscious, uh, like the surrealist often did, towards, towards the consciousness, I think often that would be also interesting to, to turn the other way around. You know, I have to say that the other thing, which, which is an unusual point, you, don't, you hear more discussions of Prozac than you do of Freud at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that may mean. So, in, a, in an odd way, you, you're turning the discussion back to something which may have a more durable legitimacy than, than you know, visiting the local pharmacist. But it's a, but it's a frame, but it's a frame of reference which, for the moment, seems to be in abeyance. It's also interesting in, in terms of the way you presented it that, you, that you're presenting a whole series of very innovative ideas wrapped, going back to the, to the Michelin man, wrapped in, in a long history of cultural discourse and, mm. and, and, and tying, it, tying it into that. I think the, the point was with this endless business, you can always just get the hell out of the thing and go home. 
you know, but in a, in a, <laughs> in somebody, yeah. otherwise everybody is going around. But, but uh, the, the implication of, of endlessness is a, is a, is a philosophical or psychotherapeutic idea, like you never get to, you know, Daedalus or something. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I I, I must. Uh, Therefore, I, you have to keep talking. <laughs> yeah, I, I keep. I will keep talking as long as you keep talking too. I'm just kidding. If, um, um, but it's not only Freud. Eh? It's it's actually particularly lately for me neuroscience also. Like neuroscience. I mean, may, maybe I'm more fascinated in neuroscience than than Freud. But but. And for that reason, you have to uh, read Kandel. Kandel, who goes back to his period when he was as a student uh, in Vienna, and then uh, learned so much from psychoanalysis, and 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 thought that so many things were not fully uh, uh, exploited in in that science, and so went into neuroscience. And through his whole description, going back to Vienna he re reinterpreted some of these uh, 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 qualities of that time in such a new, uh, brilliant way that, that when I, um, in a time when I studied so much the work of Bacon, for instance, and uh, Francis Bacon, then I thought that, that his work was so much related to also Freud, in a way, so that it was highly surreal, this, this nose and ears who moved into one gesture and that you couldn't point anymore where the nose was in the face and so, et cetera, in the, in the, in the paintings of uh, Bacon. But, but um, it's quite beautiful to make that line and I think that there, the, the writing book have, have to do the job, is that I'd like to draw that line back to, uh, to the earlier work, the Phoenix painting, painters, towards Bacon and then, for instance, Lucien Freud uh, lately. Uh, how, how, how through, for instance, self-portrait, so much can be read in the articulation through techniques in the painting uh, of the character. Yeah. I think Bacon, Bacon is the guy who said, I don't know, maybe he didn't say it, maybe he should have, but I think he said, everything you do in the end is autobiographical. And, and which is very different, I think, than your discussion of bringing in all of these pieces that it, in a way it doesn't belong to you. And I think his argument was, if it's legit, it comes from you, otherwise. Hmm. Yeah, did, you hear, did you hear what yeah. he said? Yeah, yeah, you don't <laughs> need to refer to these references because if you're in the building, then, then probably that will be uh, different. But that is true. But, but on the other hand, the other they're, hand part of, they're part of part your of life. No, they're part, part of, of you. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Yes. Ben, I, um, I want to, I, this may be a way of kind of asking Eric's question again, but I don't think it is. I mean, having visited a lot of these buildings, one of the things that doesn't seem to be entering into the conversation yet is the cyclical nature of a lot of these. And so when you go to Nijmegen, for instance, which is a very simple building, and you kind of experience the galleries in a way that you find yourself repeating yourself, and it, that kind of happens in Mercedes in a different way as you kind of go up and go back down. And the way that you... Um, so carefully modulate the color, for instance, that what happens is something not unlike what you described in the after image essay, mm. in that as you kind of move through, so you feel the kind of echo of mm. some place that yeah. you've been, but it's not the same place. Yeah. And I think that, that that's a really important yeah. part of it, that, that the, the kind of cyclical nature of these things, which I would guess comes out of some of the, the temporal studies from Arnhem and the Mobius house and kind of back a little further. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the, that, how you choreograph the cycle of not so much endlessness, but a very subtle development through stages. Yeah, it's, that's, uh, 
Yeah, that's an interesting question. Also, particularly when you uh, bring in the, the notion of the after image, because that is what uh, that that might interest you maybe as well. Is that this whole idea that that you, if you are able to to move around certain concepts of reading of a particular large detail in a building, like maybe I, how I describe the hands of uh, of uh, the work um, in. Uh, in the work of Schiele. Um, similarly, you can find that in the Falkov Museum with the staircase, because the yeah. staircase is actually, the staircase is a staircase in a staircase within the staircase. So, but the staircase is actually a construction that it brings you from, 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 let's say, the lower part of the building to the galleries, but it brings you also to, the, to, to other different program elements. So the staircase becomes a program divider uh, on the other hand, so, so but it also it brings you back to the city, which I think is also very bring, important. Yeah, ex exactly, and to the next layer of the landscape. So you start here in the building, and then you step up to the to the the more Roman view of the landscape. You know that, eh, that the side is in, uh, split between a Roman historical side and then, and a kind of a, a more kind of a younger side on the location. So. So here, the notion of endlessness is maybe to be read in, 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 in the way how you approach this staircase, because it constantly gives you new information. It gives you new different directions in the way how you step into this space uh, of the staircase, and where the staircase becomes almost the building. Uh, every, everything there becomes a part of the building. And that's what I said about the ceiling, too. There is something to be found in the ceiling, but is uh, constantly coming back as an, as an kind of Guides, guiding s s space, like maybe this blanket above us, what, what is uh, giving you constant new interpretations in the way how you orient it in this space. Well, the staircase that we're all <coughs> have a no, the staircase is doing all, it's going a bit, because sometimes there's a bridge in the staircase and sometimes there's a slow staircase, so they have all kinds of different times also in the way how they step up and, uh, and down. One moment. First, thank you. I, I'm very impressed by the work. Um, my question actually is a kind of a simpler one in the sense of um, to understand um, many of your arguments seems to almost introduce like a certain notion of distance or neutrality into it. But then the work has a very coherent uh, repertoire of aesthetic maneuvers, let's say for the sake of and almost I would say there's a level of obsession that came reappearing from project to project to project. Uh, my question is if that for you is part of building to the system that you're trying to argue in terms of the apparatus to work, or is something that more has to do with aesthetic principles that they have their own entity and are kind of independent? Because there is a kind of a very strong coherency from project to project. And one, if they really, if the whole neutrality of the argument would be completely so, one would expect that each project will be very incredibly different from one to the other, but I think there is a kind of underlying coherency that move from project to project, which to me is fascinating. And that obsession, I, again, I don't know how much that relates to kind of the psychoanalytical aspect, but there's something about that, the, the obsession that I find fascinating, and I don't know if you have anything to comment on that. Um, yes. Uh, but if you, I mean, I, I would not fully, uh, well, I agree with the aspect of uh, what I call the seriality in the work. I, I, I think that's there. So, so, but if you would, I need to do a diagram for that. If I, if I would, if, if you would see, let's say, the pavilions in a relationship of how they, how they influence the, the buildings, then I can maybe draw around five to six buildings, sometimes about around one diagram. So, so if you take uh, the influence of certain models of thinking, then there are, there are several buildings who are connected to several projects, even furniture, who are connected to uh, some of these prototypes, you could call it. But there is no, I would say there is no continuity to be found in the, in the, in the whole oeuvre, I hope. Because there was a particular period where, where we even tested um, many other geometrical articulations in the way how we uh, tested uh, spatial effects. Uh, like I said, from the box to the blob, uh, everything was tested uh, in this uh, geometrical transformative uh, chains. 
but but you're right on the other hand that there is a seriality to be found in a group of works and that's what I think is uh, fascinating I, I've never believed in the masterpiece I don't think that uh, that's the you know in architecture that has been a little bit uh, and kind of an obsession where, where I think artists have liberated themselves from a long time ago you know the seriality why could you not have you know, six buildings talking about the same topic and test it in many, many different layers. Yeah? To ask a question, make a comment. Um, most of your work and your buildings make one feel as though you've just been shot out of, the individual's been shot out of a cannon. Could you, could you speak in the microphone a little bit? Oh, I don't know how to work it. Oh. Many of your space, uh, your buildings and your spaces make one feel as though one's at a skate, a perpetual skate park experience or just being shot out of a cannon. And that's wonderful, but I sense a, a uh, non-address to intimacy, that there's very little intimate about your spaces. And all your spaces are moving and very exciting. But there's, I, I don't see any spaces of quiet where we address ourselves, where we address our relationship with others. It's just a constant, oh, we can't stop, and how Freudian can this be? We can't stop here, let's keep moving. There's another cannon over here that I can shoot you out of. I'm sure you've heard this before. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, I've never heard it before because, I mean, in, in, uh, you know, it's not so that I promote only motion and that, that I promote a particular kind of uh, mobility in architecture alone. What I'm arguing is that we, luckily enough, have always a mobile mind and, and we've all, we are always thinking. And, and I hope that even when you are moving or either sitting down and... and, and and hide yourself in the building because I mean it's not so that that our buildings are very s over flexible and over uh, modern in such a sense that 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 you cannot hide and that you cannot uh, seclude yourself. So so when you seclude, then you have luckily enough the the after image of that moment when you moved, <laughs> and and you can meditate on it. And and this notion of reflection of the reflective mind is more my interest than, let's say, motion in architecture. So, you, I mean, sorry, but you have it totally wrong. 